Time for questions to the Minister of Enterprise, Trade and Investment. Uh, I must tell members that questions 7 and 11 have been withdrawn. I call Mr Fergal McKinney. Mr McKinney. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Question number one. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Speaker. With your permission, I'll answer questions 1 and 10 together. Uh, reducing our corporation tax rate to 12.5 per cent, which we have now committed to doing so from 2018, will bring with it the potential to transform the local economy by creating well in excess of 30,000 additional jobs and boosting output by around a further 10 per cent by 2033 when compared to a business as usual pathway. We have already begun planning so that we can maximise this potential. For example, work is currently underway around gaining market insight into the new FDI markets that a lower rate will open doors to, looking at the types and the sectors of those investments and the parts of the world that we should be targeting for those investments. We are doing it in collaboration with the Department for Employment and Learning. The results of this work will feed into their recently launched skills barometer to help ensure that any expected skills shortages can be identified, that they can be planned for and addressed, so that companies have the right skills and the right talent they need to make their operations here a success under a lower corporation tax regime. I call Mr. Fergal McKinney for a supplementary. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The question did refer to discussions with the uh, uh, Minister for Employment and Learning, and I didn't notice that there wasn't any reflection on whether the discussions or not. But I, I, I do have a comment that the Minister made yesterday in the, in the Chamber in relation to uh, principally around Fresh Start. Uh, uh, discussions um, and saying that it is important that we start now to invest more in skills. Simply waiting until the 2018 to do so will not be effective. That does not instill me, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I am sure it will not instill other uh, members of the House with any confidence that these discussions are being had or are being productive. I think the, the member is not aware of the full scale uh, of the facts. I'll set that out a little better for him in terms of our discussions. We have ongoing discussions with Dell. Um, Minister Farney has always made himself available and his officials available, and we constantly share uh, the understanding and intelligence that we have, sometimes up to three times a day, and particularly when we're, we're faced with major challenges. Uh, like we have been in some areas uh, in North Antrim, we, we will meet like, literally throughout that day. So I can assure the member that, that there is a series of constant uh, discussions going on with Dell. And uh, I, I have to praise the input that Dell have given this department in terms of making sure that we are fit for purpose. But all of us around this chamber are aware today that our unemployment is 5.9 per cent. The European Union average is 9.5 per cent. What we want to do is make sure that 5.9 per cent, which is too many, that we can drive it down. And how do we do it? We do it by advertising the fact that Northern Ireland can literally lead in terms of tax, in terms of talent, and in terms of costs. Northern Ireland business operates about 85 per cent of the UK costs and 95 per cent of the Republic of Ireland costs. We have a tremendous asset, and it now behoves everyone in this chamber to go out and sell it and bring the jobs to Northern Ireland. Well, Mr. Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers today. Can the Minister give me uh, his assessment of how we can address the real challenges relating to manufacture, obviously energy, the, the cost of labour, the cost of transportation, all are challenges that need to be addressed. Manufacturing has faced significant challenges. Manufacturing, and I want to pay tribute to the men and women in Northern Ireland who have taken our manufacturing to new levels of growth and who have added jobs in the manufacturing sector. Now, I want to cut through all of the spin and let's go straight for the hard economic data on manufacturing. And let me refer to some words that were given to us by Professor Neil Gibson. The manufacturing sector is larger in Northern Ireland than the United Kingdom average. 
It uh, accounts for about 13.6% of GVA, or gross value added, and it accounts for 10% of our employment. Now, when we benchmark Northern Ireland against other parts uh, of our United Kingdom, their UK average, we have manufacturing at 13.6 of GVA, the UK average is 10%. We have manufacturing in terms of employment at 10%. The UK average is 8%. And I want to pay tribute to those people out there who are manufacturing. Because we have a great manufacturing base, we have people who are working extremely hard, and we need to go forward and attract further manufacturing jobs to Northern Ireland on the basis of our lower corporation tax, on the basis of the talent of our people, and also on the basis of cost. Call Mr. Adrian Cochrane Watson. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I thank the Minister for his response to date, and I welcome the, the research and analysis which is underway, particularly with Dale. Um, but does the Minister expect that we will be attracting new jobs in the manufacturing sector? And does the Minister want to clarify his recent comments made to me when he did quote, Don't let anybody tell you that manufacturing in Northern Ireland is in a difficult position? Because I would remind the Minister, we have seen well over 1,000 redundancies announced in the manufacturing sector. Can I say to the member, I'm more than happy to clarify, because unlike the member, I will not talk manufacturing down in Northern Ireland. When manufacturing is growing in Northern Ireland, it doesn't serve any purpose for small people to try to make themselves look tall by talking about where jobs are lost. If he had have listened to what Michelin said, not what I said, what the workers said, they said we were beaten in terms of a 5 million reduction in the European tyre market. There was nothing more government could have done or Invest Northern Ireland could have done. Their words, Mr Cochrane Watson, they're not mine. I suppose when I'm on my feet I should clarify because you very foolishly attempted to introduce a point of accuracy into this House in relation to Schrader. Can I say to them from my conversations with them during the week that they are still practicing the Schrader? They have been bought over in the same way Moy Park has been bought over, but they still practice as Moy Park. So your ignorance of your constituency appears to extend to your ignorance of company law. We don't take points of order until the end of question time. I'm sorry. Don't challenge the chair. I think it maybe is opportune for me at this stage to say. Keep your questions succinct and don't encourage debates. It is question time. I call Mr. Martin Muller. I'm sure that's a warning for me, and I'll take it on board. Uh, could I ask the Minister, because uh, one thing we do agree on is that the Fresh Start Agreement certainly give confidence to the business community and those who wish to build the economy. But in that context, has he seen the prosperity plan of the previous member from the SDLP who spoke as because I haven't seen this prosperity plan. Has the minister seen the prosperity plan, which perhaps has an alternative way to grow the economy? And if he has, can you give me his assessment of the SDLP prosperity plan? What we want to do, I think, under Fresh Start and the business community, and I've talked to the trade unions, I've talked to the CBI, I've talked to the Chamber of Commerce, and the one thing, the consistent message they have been given us is. We want all the politicians in Northern Ireland to work together. We want the executive to work together. And there's an onus now on all of us that we have established because the business community thrives on confidence. Now, what can we say? We can go to the rest of the world and say Northern Ireland today attracts more foreign direct investment than any other part of the United Kingdom, thanks to the skills of its people a low-cost operating base, the talent of its people, and one of the best educated workforces and youth workforce that Europe actually has. So what all of us have to do, I think, is put our shoulders behind the wheel. I don't think there will be any advantage given by people who seek to snipe and carp from the sidelines, to talk down people's jobs, to talk down the growth in manufacturing. We should be talking Northern Ireland up, because our people are delivering ahead of the UK averages, including in manufacturing, despite the ignorance of what some members will try and tell you. Call Mr. Jim Allister. I, say I find the complacency of the Minister about the decline in our manufacturing uh, as quite astounding. 
but he talks about ongoing discussions with the Dell minister, which are going to produce the skills needed if he's exaggerated claim about 30,000 jobs uh, on back of corporation tax is ever to be met. But the same Dell minister has time without number in recent months complained vigorously and publicly about the lack of commitment to skills and skilling up and training to meet that challenge. So how is it that the minister thinks he's having, making progress about delivering these things and the minister in charge, the Dell minister, doesn't seem to know anything about it? Well, we have just got another prime example of a small person that needs to try to talk other people down, to talk the manufacturing industry down, an attempt, an attempt to make himself look big. I tell the member, contrary to what he would self-believe, he doesn't know it all. None of us do. The reality that we have got is from Professor Neil Gibson of 30,000 jobs. Now, the member, I know, believes himself to be a self-professed expert in everything, but he's not. And we turn to the best evidence that we have. So here we have in Northern Ireland an opportunity to attract 30,000 jobs in Northern Ireland. And the small-minded petty can just snarl. Not a word about going out around the world trying to attract jobs. Not a word about the manufacturing sector and the skills we do have. And the interesting thing, to the best of my knowledge, and particularly for his constituency, I think I've spoken to every party in this House. The only party that has never spoken to me directly about manufacturing is the member. And is it the case that the member is the perfect embodiment of the hollow vessel from North Antrim? Sounds loudest. Uh, I will not remind the member again any more remarks from statutory position, and he will not be heard for a very long time. I call Mrs. Pam Cameron. Question number two, please. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Speaker. Uh, can I say, firstly, I would like to congratulate the Northern Ireland team for qualifying top of their group. Uh, it was a wonderful night to be at Windsor Park and to witness it at first hand, and that tremendous atmosphere of everybody together celebrating Northern Ireland's success, and it's a, perhaps a lesson to all of us in this House. I want to wish the Northern Ireland team every success in the finals in France next summer, and I should say too, my thoughts are very much with the people uh, of France and Paris in particular. Tourism Northern Ireland has been working closely in recent years with various sporting organisations such as the Irish Football Association, in developing market initiatives to promote Northern Ireland. In terms of the European Championships 2016, Tourism Northern Ireland will work with its partners, Tourism Ireland, to exploit any potential destination marketing and PR opportunities to promote Northern Ireland in overseas markets. Call Mrs Cameron for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his, uh, his answer. And whilst it's hugely important that we support the Northern Ireland football team in France, I was, however, disappointed to note that the Department for Culture, Arts and Leisure have not held a reception for the Northern Ireland team at Stormont. Given that the decal minister has previously welcomed foreign nations to Parliament buildings, does the Minister plan to welcome uh, the team to Stormont in the near future and show um, his support for our home team? Yeah, yeah. Yes, I have already uh, issued an invitation which I understand uh, will be taken up by the Northern Ireland uh, football team and the management around them because it is important for us to celebrate what is the huge success of the Northern Ireland team and what they have achieved because even under the old rules of qualification for the Euros, Northern Ireland would have qualified this time as well. There was no playoff required for the team. They delivered, and they delivered well, and came in top of their group. And they deserve the support uh, of all of us. And the success, not only of our football team, but also comes in the back of the success of Rory McIlroy, Darren Clark, Graham McDowell, Carl Frampton, AP McCoy, our Commonwealth Games team, our Olympians, and the Ireland and Ulster rugby teams. 
So it would be outrageous in the success if our football team was not recognised here uh, in Stormont, and that's why I spoke with the IFA, and we'll ensure that a suitable date, uh, hopefully uh, around about the time of the March uh, international break, will be here to honour the team. And I just hope that all of us, because uh, when I looked at uh, Windsor Park and I looked at Northern Ireland completely united behind the team in one of the best nights uh, that I've ever enjoyed, and it did give not only a huge lift to those that were there, I think it gave a huge lift uh, to the country, and I hope we can all come together and celebrate that success together. Well, Mr. Mike Nesbitt. Uh, Deputy Speaker, thank you. I would be grateful if the Minister would share with the House his assessment of how well utilised were the opportunities uh, that presented at the last finals Northern Ireland qualified for, Spain 82 and Mexico 86. And would he agree with the constructive criticisms at the time of Harold McCusker, a politician I know that he, like I, uh, hold in great uh, esteem. Firstly, I would like to uh, associate myself with the remarks uh, of the late Harold McCusker, a person who I had the privilege to know uh, personally. He was a leader, he was a gentleman, and he was uh, one of the finest men of integrity uh, that I ever knew, and he made an enormous uh, contribution. I probably can't say too much about Spain uh, 1982. I can remember very late at night, at 12 years of age, uh, watching it, allowed to stay up uh, on the Friday night as Jerry Armstrong uh, put through that goal. But what I can tell him is, my office is open, both to him and to anybody else, to come and let's share ideas, let's look at what synergies we can get out of our collective wisdom, and let's use them collectively. The Northern Ireland team is delivering on the field. I think Northern Ireland's politicians have delivered in terms of the fresh start. Uh, our young people are delivering in terms of some of the best educational results in Europe. And our people, with, uh, you know, for the most of this last uh, five-year period, Northern Ireland has had significantly lower levels of unemployment than the Republic of Ireland, and for most of the period has been below the UK average. So out there, uh, people are delivering, and they're delivering success. Let's utilise that success for the advantage of future generations. Call Mrs. Karen McKevitt. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I thank, uh, first of all, the member for the question? I think it's very prudent uh, uh, for the ti and, and timing um, of it. And, uh, and it answers that the, the minister's right, um, where the people uh, are delivering ahead of anyone, and I would include our sports people. And I'd like to congratulate and take this opportunity again in the House to congratulate. Um, the Northern Ireland uh, football team and indeed the Irish football team who have also qualified. And I think there's a, an opportunity here uh, for the Minister who, who is a great promoter of uh, sport tourism and there will be an opportunity for him to start delivering uh, for the people in our communities, maybe by opening up um, a conversation with our own executive colleagues and the Irish Government uh, on the economic benefits of an all-Ireland tourism strategy. Has the Minister any plans for this to happen? I would the member to and acknowledging the work the department put in. I've only been in it for six months. And my predecessor, Arlene Foster, did a tremendous job, and particularly for the member's own constituency, because I mean, the Irish Open has only sold out, as I understand it, twice in its history once in uh, Royal Port Rush, and secondly in Royal County Down. And we celebrated some over 107,000 paying spectators, wall to wall coverage, and that particular section. Uh, boosted not only our golf tourism strategy, uh, but also our goal in tourism of delivering tourism as a £1 billion industry by 2020. And we are already over three quarters of a billion this year uh, en route to that target of a £1 billion industry. I have been working with uh, the Irish Government, particularly in relation to getting the Rugby World Cup uh, to Ireland in 2023. Uh, it's important that we have the right uh, stadia, uh, but it's also important in the sense that some of the provisional figures said that we could attract somewhere in the region of 350,000 people uh, to Ireland, and in particular, Northern Ireland could play a key role uh, in terms of around about eight rugby international uh, matches and perhaps also a quarter final. And that would be a tremendous gift. Uh, for, for Northern Ireland in particular, were we able to pull it off? Because we have earned a reputation 
in Northern Ireland from the G8, the Giro, the two successful Irish Opens. And let's not forget, we're going to have the world's greatest tournament in golf at uh, Royal Portrush in 2019. We've got an earned reputation of pulling off international events hugely successfully, and I'll do all my power to back all of that to drive our tourism beyond the one billion target by 2020. Call Mrs. Dolores Kelly for a question. Question three, please, Deputy Speaker. Northern Ireland supported 13 Northern Ireland companies to attend the Food Hotel China exhibition in Shanghai last month. The fourth year uh, Northern Ireland companies have exhibited at the event. Invest Northern Ireland has also supplemented its in-market China team and has now three trade advisors based in Shanghai and one in Beijing. Uh, the team works closely with our agri-food companies. Invest Northern Ireland also hosts visits from Chinese food buyers. And this allows buyers to experience at first hand the quality of our food products and also the security of our supply chain. And I believe there to be significant potential in China for our agri-food industry, which Northern Ireland will continue to promote because we have a strong academic evidence base to show that Northern Ireland is producing the safest food in the world. And with companies such as our Moy Parks with 6,000 uh, employees, we want it for them to grow in order that we can grow the economy and jobs in Northern Ireland. Call Mrs Kelly for supplementary. <clears throat> Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And I thank the Minister for his answer. Could the Minister outline if there are any plans to further the work of Invest in I with the second tier cities? Because I think there are some criticisms that people tend to concentrate their efforts on Beijing and Shanghai, but there's enormous opportunity in other provinces. And further to um, Mr. Mueller's earlier comments, would the Minister express surprise that given Sinn Féin's recent marriage to, and, and wedlock with the Tories, that he's now begging the SDLP for our economic policy document? Uh, I fear, Principal Deputy Speaker, I shouldn't interfere on private grief. <laughs> Can I say, firstly, uh, I would like to congratulate uh, the member because uh, she has led hugely successfully uh, the all-party group on China. Secondly, she was instrumental from 2010 in ensuring that Northern Ireland got some 8 million investment into Ulster University. And today, uh, through the work that she led on, and the Confucius Institute, from Aquinas Grammar in Belfast, Bangor Academy in my area, Southwest Regional College, Melbourne Primary and Coleraine, I could go through the list of the eight hubs. We are delivering some £27 million of investment directly from the Chinese government in our children learning Mandarin. And I think this year alone, over 1,500 of our children have qualified uh, in Mandarin. And when I went out and saw some children from the west of the province who had gone into school on Saturday to specifically learn and get their first HK qualification, it was quite inspirational. Her question was regarding the other tiered cities, and we have been following Vice Premier Liu Yandong's advice, and we are looking very much, uh, particularly with Shenyang and Liaoning province in the northeast. Uh, I travelled up there, uh, we brought the news of what our companies can offer. We were able to deliver the news in terms of corporation tax, the talent of our people, the, the cost efficiency uh, of producing uh, and creating jobs in Northern Ireland. Uh, the British Embassy is fully supportive of that particular link between Northern Ireland and the northeastern part, Liaoning Province, and Shenyang Yinko in particular, and we'll continue to exploit and deliver those links, not just for education in Northern Ireland, but also to create jobs in Northern Ireland. Call Mr Gordon Knight. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I'm sure the Minister will join with me in welcoming the news uh, about uh, exports uh, of pork products to uh, China. Would the uh, Minister give, an assessment, uh, give his assessment to the House of the further opportunities that there are uh, for exports for, for our agri-food sector? Yeah, and I first of all would like to congratulate two uh, distinguished women uh, for what they have achieved. First one was uh, my predecessor, Arlene Foster, um, who took a specific initiative in terms of trade to lead uh, a number of trade missions uh, on agri-food to China. And secondly, the Minister for Agriculture and Rural Development, Michelle O'Neill, who has given some of the best news that I think has been heard in the period of this Assembly, which is that we have subject to some uh, qualifications for both Caro and Dunbia. 
that uh, we will be able to export our pork product uh, into China. And the initial view on that, that's feeding through to me in terms of trade, is that is an investment of somewhere in the region of £10 million. Pounds. I do want to see us also being able to uh, develop in terms of our poultry, in terms of our beef, and in terms of our lamb. I mean, manufacturing exports, including food, and some people like to joke uh, regarding international travel in, tr in China, but manufacturing exports, including food to China, have increased by 58% over the current program for government. It rose from 2010-2011 from 60.3 million to where it stands today at 95.5 million in 2014-15. The job of all of us, and I'll be happy to lead, agriculture has certainly delivered in terms of pork. Arlene at Foster and her time there delivered in terms of all the trade opportunities that I'm now able to build upon. And all of us have an enormous prize of taking across next year our exports to China above the 100 million barrier. Call Mr. Alex Maskey. Uh, government, I could ask him, Kola, could I ask the Minister, well, first of all, commend him for the uh, comprehensive responses so far, and uh, obviously has confirmed the role of the DARD as well, and the Minister, Michelle O'Neill. Could the Minister outline perhaps some of the work that will be required at the time ahead in terms of forward work planning with the various departments, including DARD, to enhance the work already undertaken? We'll work totally together, DARD and DETI, to deliver our agri-food product into China, because the market is just so huge. Um, we, we could, the sky is the limit in terms of the number of jobs that we could collectively create if we could get those licenses through. And that was an enormously successful piece of work that Michelle O'Neill pioneered to get the licensing, to get the product in. That was built upon a background uh, where Arlene Foster created numerous opportunities for our businesses to then having the license to, to, to now take the full advantage of that into the markets with the relevant uh, distributors. Obviously, export certification is a reserved matter. Uh, Department of Environment, Food and Rural Affairs in Westminster, they've taken the lead uh, in terms of opening up the exports of pork with ourselves. And I want to continue to work very closely with DEFRA uh, to achieve the same result, but for chicken and for beef and for lamb. Um, because the announcement, particularly in terms of pork for Northern Ireland's industry, it adds values to the carcass for both the producers and uh, for the processors. And it's only when the pork processing plants are formally listed uh, on the Chinese government websites can those uh, exports actually uh, begin. It has taken a number of years to get to this point, and it would be remiss of me not to congratulate the agri-food industry for their patience and their commitment uh, to achieving the result, uh, which is, as I say, worth in the region of £10 million pounds of additional export sales. I hope and believe that to be a conservative estimate, given the size of the market, uh, the population of almost 1.4 billion people, and their appetite for our pork, chicken, beef dishes in Northern Ireland that we do so safely and so well. Call Ms. Curtina Ran for a question. Question number four, Kesh Divra Cahar, Led the Hall. VS Northern Ireland continues to offer support for the development of new tourism accommodation projects in South Down. Support is aimed at encouraging the development of new accommodation in line with the forecast future demand. New accommodation developments may benefit from capital support from Invest Northern Ireland if the promoter can demonstrate that the project is market driven with the capability of attracting visitors from outside Northern Ireland and not displacing people from similar projects. Uh, Invest Northern Ireland is happy to work or engage with any promoter who may meet that criteria for support. And Ms. Ryan for supplementary. And would the Minister agree with me that the South Down, like other uh, counties in the north of Ireland, needs the range of accommodation provision because accommodation is the biggest spend of any tourist. Um, we need the B&Bs, we need the hostel, we need the hotels and we need the self-catering. And I wonder could he outline what he is doing, it because there's currently a lack of provision, particularly in the southern end of the county. Um, and I wonder could he outline what work he's doing to ensure that is created. Well, 
I mean, what I want to see is projects coming forward from the area uh, that look at our criteria. I've laid out the criteria for how you can access um, support. And in terms of locally owned businesses I, and in terms of total support, I can go through thousands of offers, not just for tourism offering, but that we have given uh, to the South Down parliamentary constituency through that area. Because it, the member is, is right. I, I alluded to it earlier when speaking to uh, Mrs. McEvitt uh, in terms of what South Down has to offer. I mean, not only was it the success of 107,000 paying spectators at the last Irish Open, it was a success on companies like the, or television companies like the Golf Channel that broadcast the sheer geographical beauty of South Down for dozens of hours back to back to back. Now, what I can say to the member is I know that in the area that the Newry Moore and Down District Council area, there's 312 uh, premises um, and there are 1,200 rooms, uh, but that at the minute, to answer the member's question, excludes self-catering as that's not recorded. And we have about 4,288 bed spaces. And I think anybody that's had the privileges I have over different times to be at the Sleep Donard or uh, the Burndale, the Donard Hotel, and a Skeen County House, you know, right through to the Canal uh, Court Hotel and Spa in Uri, will know that not only do you get a wonderful tourism offering with the heritage uh, that's there to offer, with the world's best golf courses that are there to offer, and some of the best uh, shopping and leisure opportunities, but you also get some of the best quality hotel and B&B accommodation in Northern Ireland. I'm afraid that ends the period for listed questions. We will now move on to topical questions, and I call Ms. Megan Fearham. Uh, I can ask the Minister for his assessment of preparations for the year of food and drink 2016. We have been uh, conducting, um, and it's not only my preparation, it's also the preparations of a very distinguished team with some key figures in it, like Michelle Sherlow, uh, Hart Hastings, and a number of others. And we also cooperate with Minister O'Neill's department in Dard. Um, what we have done is we launched, first of all, uh, the programme in Amsterdam. We took a, a, a Dutch uh, chef, but based in Bangor in County Down, uh, across to Amsterdam, where we had some of the leading travel and uh, food critics in Europe. Uh, we were able to host some specific produce that we have taken forward. Further to that, we have uh, taken forward uh, a number of festivals, for example, the Cumber Potato Festival. Uh, which was uh, hugely successful, uh, where a number of products and sort of bespoke products could also put their, bring their product to market. We further to that then did an event in Titanic uh, building itself, where we showcased all of the specific uh, Northern Ireland foods. And what I've done uh, most recently uh, was bring uh, quite literally hundreds of people together to the Stormont House Hotel in Belfast and where we brought from every county uh, in Northern Ireland, uh, and we set out stalls of our products, and we brought some of the leading critics from uh, MasterChef and others. Other people are probably more expert in the cookery programs than I am, but uh, some of those leading critics were there. And it was an opportunity for us to bring buyers uh, by the hundred through the hotel to let them see what Northern Ireland specifically had to offer. And I should say I was particularly delighted that Madam Wang, our new Consul General in Northern Ireland from China, came along to look at the quality of the produce that we have to offer, because uh, the knowledge base is saying that we have the safest food in the world, and particularly in Asian markets, the first criteria they are looking for is safe food, and Northern Ireland can deliver. Thank the Minister. Uh, for his answer so far. I asked the Minister if he will encourage Tourism NI to work closely with Falsha Ireland, um, um, who have recently launched a network of food champions across the South in developing plans over the coming year. I mean, absolutely. Tourism Northern Ireland works uh, very well with uh, Tourism Ireland uh, in terms of the product that we have to offer. I was just back from uh, China uh, last week, uh, where we had uh, significant travel agencies from China. 
And we understand that in the future, millions of people will be traveling uh, because the economy is becoming so successful. And what we did with an up particular event, uh, the information was largely supported uh, from the expertise of Tourism Northern Ireland, but was delivered in that particular market by Tourism Ireland. And I can tell you that there were, when I say a, a full room in the center of a major Shanghai hotel looking to bring their travel companies and to lead tours uh, to Northern Ireland. I think the latest figure I got for the Giants Causeway alone was 28,000 uh, Chinese uh, visitors. But well, not only that last event that we did in the Stormont Hotel, we had some uh, of the Irish uh, food critics up and we also had some of their uh, award winners. And we will share best practice and expertise because our agri-food industry over the last period has performed against some of the worst economic conditions that there have ever been for most of our lifetimes. That trajectory is going up and it's all of us need to get behind them and support them. Call Mr Jerry Kelly for a topical question. Would the Minister like to comment on the recent awarding of Michelin stars to Dean's Abbey restaurant and the Ox restaurant in Belfast? And the effect uh, of the image of Belfast uh, as a t and this uh, the effect it has on the image of uh, Belfast as a tourist uh, destination. It raises a, a hugely valid uh, question for tourism and our economy in Northern Ireland, because the award of those uh, two uh, Michelin stars, both to the Ox and uh, to, to Dean's Epic, um, puts Northern Ireland on a world food map for excellence. Uh, many of us knew it was there but the award actually confirms it and elevates it uh, to a number of websites and travel agencies as an additional offering that there is to Belfast. I have to say I have never, and I, I was a Belfast boy born, bred and probably battered, but I have never been more optimistic for Belfast than I am today. We look at the number of hotels that there are coming in from Biancor, Bill Woolsey, to right through to four to five star, uh, the Hastings Hotel, hotels that closed in Belfast in the 70s are now reopening bigger and better uh, in premises right at the heart of what is a great city. The food offering will greatly complement that success. Well, Mr Kelly, for supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for his uh, answer up to now. And I would like to join others who have congratulated the uh, these two restaurants and indeed uh, the entrepreneurs, the local entrepreneurs behind uh, their success. Uh, the Minister will know that there is an issue and a demand from uh, restaurateurs about the VAT burdens and about reducing the, those VAT burdens. Perhaps he could uh, speak about uh, what support or plans he has in, in supporting that demand and perhaps bring uh, the rates down to those, dare I say, the other side of the border. We can uh, support fully uh, the reduction uh, in the rate. It is not within our power uh, to deliver it. It is a reserve matter. I spoke recently uh, in London, I say recently, a couple of months ago, uh, in London at the British Hospitality Association and made the exact plea that, that you have made to allow uh, our industry to be competitive. Um, I have also spoken um, to the Secretary of State, spoken to Boris Johnson and others, specifically in relation to try to get uh, that uh, reduced. I support fully the work that uh, Hospitality Ulster has done and also the Northern Ireland Hotel uh, Federation. Um, and we will continue to push at that door. I am not being given any indication that we are, we are going to be able to get a change, but we will continue uh, to push at that door because even the latest figures that we have is showing our trajectory of tourism visitors uh, to Northern Ireland is up. And, you know, Belfast is thriving. Crumlin Road uh, Courthouse is an immense uh, visitor experience, and it's sometimes best not just to think of what we think about it, but to actually go to see what the other, uh, the industry is saying, but also what the people who experience it are saying in terms of the Crumlin Road in your own courthouse, in your own um, constituency. And the trajectory of the success of that particular tourism initiative has been huge. The feedback is huge. I'm not sure if it still is. I haven't checked recently, but I know it was the leading attraction particularly for Belfast. So when you put quality from Titanic through to the Crumlin Road Courthouse to this morning HMS Caroline, you put on the back of that new hotels, a new conference centre, and you, you put all of that together, you realise Belfast is really on the move.
Well, Mr. Alban McGuinness for a topical question. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, given the prospect of a referendum on the European Union and Britain's or the UK's um, membership of the European Union, if there was a referendum tomorrow, uh, what way would the Minister for Enterprise vote? Well, the reality is there isn't a referendum tomorrow, and there isn't likely to be a referendum, as I understand it, until uh, 2017. So what this Minister for Enterprise has done is to commission the research from Oxford Economics, because I want our people to have the best and most informed knowledge when they make these critical uh, decisions. I've not only commissioned uh, research in terms of a potential Brexit, but I've also commissioned research of what we do if we just laissez-faire as it is, what that means, what it costs. And I've also uh, asked uh, Oxford Economics and others to look towards some of the other measures that are out there. I mean, Norway, I understand, has their own arrangements. And the Swiss have a, have a different relationship. Turkey uh, has a customs uh, relationship. So the question has to be, let's get the best informed analysis to make our decision for when that referendum comes. Mr. McGuinness, for supplementary. Um, uh, uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. And I thank the Minister for his answer. Uh, quite clearly, um, he did not give me a definitive yes or no, uh, but uh, he, he did give an answer in terms of trying to inform the electorate as to the issues, and I welcome that. Uh, and could I inform the Minister that I, I would vote yes? Uh, but, but could I ask the Minister further to that? Does he foresee uh, at any stage uh, any merit in Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland being outside of the European Union? Uh, Principal, uh, Deputy Speaker, I mean, it's not my place to advise the member, but if I may be so bold to say that you should not say how you're going to answer the question before you know what the question actually is. Uh, but Northern Ireland uh, has been a net beneficiary when it comes uh, to monies that are received uh, by the EU. Uh, we, we, we don't know the referendum question, so I do, do think we have to be careful uh, in terms of, in advance of knowing the question of trying to sort of give answers. Personally, in my own position, as he knows, is the position is so ably uh, made by Diane Dodds, our MEP. I, I believe that the European Union. Uh, needs to be renegotiated, and then we will look at what comes out of that renegotiation to see. We will look at that renegotiation to see what is in the best interests of uh, Northern Ireland. But until we have had that renegotiation, and until we have had that evidence, I don't think you can start to make decisions because decisions that are made without evidence and without knowledge are usually pretty poor uh, decisions. And there is big things, uh, outcomes, uh, whatever decision we make. And that is why I think the best thing for us all to do is to look at, one, what are the advantages if we, if we do a Brexit, a complete Brexit? Uh, what are the uh, disadvantages? Uh, if, and what are the other opportunities in advance of hearing that question so that the people of Northern Ireland can be best informed? I believe, in its current form, the European Union needs to be renegotiated. Well, Mr. Raymond McCartney for a topical question. Yeah, I, uh, I, I didn't think I would love to see the day where the Crumlin Road jail and a Michelin star would be mentioned in the, in the same sentence. But, but that apart, in terms of, of the hospitality industry, and we know it does re, uh, revolve around tourism, but certainly local uh, people with, with good incomes also contributed. So, mindful of the, the issues around Michelin and our large employers. I'm just wondering if the Minister could outline some of the steps he's taken around particularly energy costs for that type of employer. Well, energy costs are but one particular part of the difficulty that all of us face in this House. It's an energy trilemma. It's not only the cost of energy, but it's also the security of our supply uh, and also the sustainability uh, of that energy. Well, you have to be very careful uh, in the sense that, yes, it is a devolved matter, and, and data can take, take a lead. But we need to be careful because DEC has informed us that if we step outside of their arrangements, that uh, we will bear the entire costs on Northern Ireland, on the domestic customer, uh, and on the business customer. 
I mean, the first thing I've been doing, and the member will be aware of this, is pressing to get our north-south uh, interconnector uh, fully working, going through its planning stages and operational, because that's the first quick win, because there's 20 million euros automatically there. And secondly, we will speak with DEC to see what individual advantages we can get uh, to Northern Ireland uh, for our renewable sector. However, I will caution the member in the sense that I have had estimates ranging from having to put up household bills from uh, £15 right up to £50. And then the consequences for that for industry are tens of thousands of pounds. And for some of our big users, it's not exaggeration to talk millions. So we will work on energy. Um, I don't believe there's going to be any immediate quick fixes. I've asked an expert panel to give me the best international practice. But energy is only one factor. Costs are a critical factor. What we can do is we can all sell Northern Ireland as having 85% of the cost of the UK, 95% of the cost of the Republic, and a lower rate of corporation tax. Call Mr McCartney for a very quick supplement. Thank you very much, and I appreciate that, uh, Deputy Speaker. Uh, just in relation to one employer, Seagate International, Terry has wrote the, I assume, all the foil MLAs, but can the Minister be mindful that an employer like Seagate energy cost is a big factor, and in terms of the wider dairy economy, Seagate plays a massive uh, role in ensuring that people have employment and disposable incomes. The member makes a point very well for his constituency, and what we have done, uh, particularly for in other parts of Northern Ireland, for example, Bombardier, this house was very supportive in a project that's valued at up to some reason of £118 million. Pounds to help them with their energy costs and potentially reduce their energy costs by uh, 25 per cent. Uh, for Michelin particularly, there was a combined, you know, initiative in terms of renewables grant assistance for three quarters of a million pounds, but unfortunately, due to other conditions beyond anybody's control uh, in Northern Ireland, that couldn't be availed of. But we will specifically look, but what I would advise the member is there is no simple answer, because if you take that energy cost away from the company, you have to put, you know, who pays for it? You know, it has to be paid for somewhere uh, along that line, and I would be very loath uh, uh, to take on board for the Northern Ireland domestic customer an increase of between 15 and up to £50 pounds, uh, per household. But we'll certainly work, and uh, you know, if the, the member wants to come to me with specific details in terms of Seagate, mindful that the economy in the West is doing well, and I, I was delighted to announce hundreds of new jobs within the first uh, couple of weeks of office in that area, which I think is a testament to the skills of the workplace uh, and also what it has to offer. Order. Time is up.